hello everyone. Um, I am always uh, loving this and loving the most the most uh, fun part about it is I get to talk to friends. So it's kind of like you get to, to uh, jump in on a coffee chat with Dr. Gottfried and I. And um, I don't know, Sarah, for sure when we first met, but I remember um, A4M, I think we've traveled in the same circles for like a decade now. <laughs> and I, true. Have, yeah, I have always admired you because um, one thing about you, you're successful, um, you are a great teacher. Um, I love that you love the science. So a lot of times um, there's, there's a lot of stuff out there and there's a lot of doctors that I think sometimes compromise on the real good truth of the science. And yet we can have that and then also come to the stage with authenticity and empathy and some of these characteristics that we'll talk about today, feminine versus masculine and how we try to um, bring our information to the, to the audiences that we teach and, um, and to the public. But I am delighted to have you here today. And I wanna just introduce you first and then we'll dive right in. So many of you have read uh, Dr. Gottfried's books and know her well. She's a wife, mom, yoga teacher, physician, and scientist who graduated from Harvard Medical School and MIT. She's the author of three New York Times bestselling books, including The Hormone Cure, The Hormone Reset Diet, and Younger. Dr. Gottfried practices integrative and precision medicine, mostly via telehealth appointments, as we all do nowadays, right? That's right. <laughs> um, you can find her website is her name. It's Sarah Gottfried, S-A-R-A-G-O-T-T-F-R-I-E-D-M-D.com. And I know she's got a wealth of information there. And I know you are in for such a treat today. So welcome, Sarah. Thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, it's it's a thrill. It's such a thrill. I mean, I I just have been so grateful for our friendship over the years. And um I just, I love, you know, kind of sharing this forward, which I hope we will do today as we usually do. Yeah, I feel like um, as far as the books, your success, the way you've changed and touched the world, the way you impact your patients' lives, you're one of those women that I just have always admired and uh, think the world of you. And I think one of those things that I really admire is a lot of people out there know how to do the business but they miss the heart or they get so involved in the business that they lose the reason why they first started doing what they were doing. And I love and admire the fact that when I see you, whether it's your speaking or your writing or our conversations, I see this genuine heart of service and love and this desire to impact the world for good. Um, I'd love to go back to your story. Like how did you get into medicine and uh, where did you start? Yeah, I didn't start in medicine. I started as an engineer and I was, I was getting a PhD in bioengineering. And at the time, my beloved grandmother was sick. She was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And it was one of those diagnoses that I think many of us have had a brush with where the medical system just completely fails us. So I watched her, you know, she, she used to pick me up from school, from the, the bus stop and drive me home. And I watched her just decline. Mm -hmm. uh, she was unable to drive me home from the bus stop. Uh, she, um, and then as I, as I progressed and she progressed in her disease, I could just see this personality draining out of her. Mm -hmm. So that's what first got me into medicine. I ended up dropping out of this PhD program to go into medicine with the intention to become a neurologist, oh, wow. um, which, you know, just feels so foreign to me now, Jill, uh, because I, I think neurology is really changing. Um, we're seeing that with David Perlmutter and with Dale Bredesen and many others. But at that time, as I got to know neurology back in 1989, it was just, you know, adios, diagnosed and adios. Um, there was so much focus on the intellectual part and not enough solutions. Mm -hmm. So that's what got me into medicine. Then once I got into medicine, I just fell in love with women's health. Um, you know, I, I practice precision medicine for both men and women, but I really felt like the personal was political when it comes to women's health. Gosh, and again, that's kind of one reason we've connected and been here today. Um, I know recently we've been active on Instagram about some of the stuff. Let's talk just briefly about what uh, happened with the journal of vascular surgery and, and how, uh, just because it's so 
I remember medical school and at the time I was so naive. And so in, interestingly enough, I was bioengineering background too. So when I heard that, I'm like, no wonder you connect. It's like this analytical heart, <laughs> how do we combine? Like, I love that. That's actually quite a rare major. We don't, I don't come across many bioengineers. So that's really cool. <laughs> I love it. Too geeky. Well, I, I think for those of us who do systems medicine, systems biology, it makes total sense, right? Totally. You know, kind of breaking the, the body into modules, but also just really understanding that the whole is much greater than the parts. I think you and I definitely have that in common. Yeah. And really it's at the core, it's problem solving and pattern recognition, right? Like I love to just listen to the bits and pieces and let my mind percolate. And then there's this recognition of patterns. Then I compare it with the labs and the science and I'm like, oh yeah, aha, here's the bingo moment, but it's all pattern recognition. And it's, it's very similar in that way to analytical engineering types of processes. So I love that. And I think it's a really valuable tool to bring to functional and integrative medicine, especially because in my um, experience, the way we analyze data, I think we bring a lot more pieces of data in. So we have to be like a superhuman computer in order to, versus just, you know, in the silos that we were taught of practicing medicine, where there's just a very, very narrow area of focus. We're really broadening that area of focus, aren't we? We totally are. And I, I'm glad you brought this up. We can talk about like what happened on social media. I'm excited to talk about that. But it's, um, I feel like the way that you take care of patients, the way that you conceive of it, and the way that I take care of patients, the way that I conceptualize it is so similar. And it's, it's this, you know, I, I think of it now as kind of deep phenotyping where we're pulling together all of these streams of data, the wearables, you know, the aura ring, what's happening with your sleep, what's happening with your heart rate variability, your, uh, what's happening with your food. I wear a continuous glucose monitor and all of these streams of data we want to like put that alongside the patient's story, the patient's narrative, you know, connecting from that heart place. So it's, it's not like 100% tech. It's this right. integration where I think the really juicy experiences come from and the healing. Yeah. And what I've noticed that's interesting is, and I want to get back to the medical school stuff because I know we have some experience to share, but it's relevant. In medical school, so I came into medical school, I didn't know any of this back then, but I was a super sensitive, empathic um, soul. And I went into medicine because I wanted to be a healer. Like I was, I think you and I, those who have, who, of us who have really embraced this, we were born healers. We just didn't know it. We kind of discovered it along the way. And what happened in medical school to me, and I'm curious to hear your experience, is I was all of the empath and the intuitiveness was kind of trained out of me. I was in this very masculine dominated world, um, very hierarchical, very paternalistic, um, extremely regimented, extremely science-based, which I love the science as do you. Um, but what happened is I stopped trusting my own heart, my own soul and my intuition. And I literally, I remember times like looking back, it was actually a quite uh, abusive environment in so many ways. <laughs> and I didn't know any better, right? So I just thought, oh, this is what, how it's supposed to be. This, I'm supposed to feel shame and guilt and I'm supposed to feel bad for being a woman and I'm supposed to be a man and a, you know, be a, pretend like I'm very masculine. And I took on all those traits and I kind of suppressed the side of myself that's very sensitive, very empathetic, very intuitive and the, the true healer within us. And I tried to become something that I was never meant to be, which is a machine and a driven producing kind of person, right? And then I have rediscovered that and I found so much joy in that and so much happiness and ability to have really help people. Because when we look at data, if we have a, a set point of a hundred pieces of data, that's easy to use science and use technology to analyze. But when we have millions of pieces of data and they include the shape of the eyes and the, and the a smile on the face and the twitch in the mouth, our intuitive and, uh, mind that's not analytical at all, our heart and our intuitive sense is actually seeing those pieces of data and putting them into the picture. And when we open ourselves up to that part of the data, I find I get way better answers and way better outcomes. And I'd love to know if your experience was similar with medical school and some of that. It was very similar. In fact, I, I wouldn't, every time I talk to you about this, I get kind of misty because um, I still have grief from medical school. Yes. And I still have grief for all of those years that you experienced and I experienced. And I know people who are watching us right now probably experienced of giving up something so true to ourselves uh, 
at the time in the service of what we thought was the greater good, which was, okay, I'm going to pass this board exam. I'm going to like move forward with this medical information. And I, I would, you know, you said it, it was borderline abusive. I would say it was downright abusive. I mean, part of subsuming your intuition and your sense about like what to ask next to probe further part of that is um is what's required when you're working 120 hours a week you know when you can't go to the bathroom when you need to go to the bathroom when you can't sleep when you need to sleep so you have this kind of override that happens and if you're not careful, and I would say I wasn't careful enough about this, in my 20s, I, I gave up my 20s for medical education. I think you did too. If you're not careful, it, it sets this, this set point for your physiology where you're just used to, you know, kind of this constant stress, not enough sleep, not enough inputs to deliver the outputs. And I, I remember one of the ways that you and I talked about this before, which I think is a great visual is our black power suits. <laughs> yeah, I love this. <laughs> so I, you know, I think you had this too. I had a series of black suits. You know, I remember when I gave my first abstract, my oral abstract um, towards the end of medical school, I did a year of uh, a research fellowship with the American Heart Association. So I was at Harvard and I did this research fellowship and I, I was invited to give a talk and I remember practicing and practicing that talk so that I, I knew it stone cold. I had the black power suit. I took a beta blocker because I didn't want to like show my nervousness. And I just contrast that yeah. with how I show up for a talk now, which is completely different. Like I, I show up for a talk now with the goal of coherence you know, with the goal to like show up fully as Sarah, like show up fully as myself, you know, to be impeccable with my word. We could go through the four agreements. That's one of the things I love um, mm -hmm. to do before a talk. But I just think about how much I gave up in that abusive, as you described, shame cycle mm -hmm. that we had through our medical training. And unfortunately, how long it took for me to kind of realize the harm in it yeah. and how it was holding me back from more authentic, loving, healing connections with my patients. Yeah. And it's, it's really the integration that I think makes us better clinicians. I love that because it's exactly so similar to my experience. For the first five years of teaching, I had the black pants suit nonetheless. And I thought I was, you know, the same thing, this calm demeanor, all um, statistics, analysis, uh, maybe once in a while, a little bit of patient vignette but there was no story, there was no heart, there was no like this patient just lost her father and she's experiencing chest pain, like this piece of connection even in the patient's story. And I remember the day where, well, first of all, I remember training in my earliest training, I was with a group of maybe six or seven women in a very small group that was training to speak. And they were all so polished. They were beautifully, impeccably dressed. And here I was like a girl from farm country, central Illinois. I felt so out of my league. And I was like, as I was speaking, sometimes I'd have a tear because I felt something in my heart. And I remember like the, the trainer there was looking at, and they said, you know, these are, this, there's this polishness uh, that can come across, but Jill has this heart piece and people are going to lean in and say, I want to hear more. And I almost cried because I felt so inadequate. I felt so much shame about who I was and I wasn't enough. And then I started to slowly, slowly wear dresses and tell stories and share very intimate details of my health history with the audience. And when I started to see Sarah, and I'm sure you've seen this too, all of a sudden, the this is the typical audience right and the walls would come down and people would lean in and they would start to cry and they would hear this and what it was it wasn't even about me it was about me reflecting their stories to them and their lives and what i started to do was think i want to give them permission because we all are in this culture of putting on a mask and appearing like we all have it together and then we all have all the answers and you remember the time when your friend or your family member or yourself you had a crisis medically and you didn't have the answer i remember that and i remember being like oh my gosh, I don't know the answer and I'm supposed to know all the answers. And every one of us in medicine has felt that a million times. And every one of us, I think, has to have permission to know it's okay to not have all the answers. That's part of the journey. 
And so part of uh, what I've loved to do is like say, hey, we're in this together. Your probably biggest struggle is someone you love who you can't fix or heal because we're supposed to, right? Or it might be yourself. And just giving that permission to the audience to be human because again, there's been this ingrainedness of we can't fail, we have to be perfect and all of those things that are false stories. But what happened is as I started to embrace and as you started to embrace yourself, people started to see our souls and ourselves for who we are. And that's attractive. People want more of that. It's not about us. It's about just coming as we are. And I'm sure have you experienced that too, that transition in the audience and how they hear you and how they respond to you. Oh, definitely. I think it's, it's a head connection versus this kind of whole body heart centered connection. And you know, I love that medical schools are starting to choose for this. You know, it used to be that it was just your scores and what was your GPA and, you know, how are your letters of recommendation? And now they're choosing for empathy and for curiosity and some of these qualities that have been, you know, called more feminine, but I think are a sign of balanced, mature, masculine and feminine. That's the way I think about it. But I agree with you. I think, um, you know, in some ways, trying to show up and be sort of the, the person who goes through the statistics and has this absolute level of certainty about exactly what's going on in the human body, um, it's exhausting. Like, <laughs> for me, it caused HPA dysregulation, like dysregulation <laughs> of on my HPA. Right. It was trauma, frankly. And yeah you know, I'm still, there's still some ways that I'm recovering from it. But I think once you call it trauma, and once you start to, you know, kind of deconstruct it and, and learn how to become fully embodied again, yes, and connect from others from that place, it's, it's so much more powerful. And it's, you know, the, the blessing is that um, even if you don't do it for the sake of authenticity and heart-centered living, you can do it for the sake of just, it's more energizing. <laughs> you know, it's not going to deplete you the way that that <laughs> amateur masculine way was depleting me. Right. right. Absolutely. A hundred percent. Um, I'd love to hear about, I mean, we've both gone through a lot of different transitions, but has there, ha, has there been any either health events or live events that started to shift that for you? Like, do you remember any points in life where you're like, Oh, this is a big shift. And the sad thing is often they come through difficulties, right? Like obstacles or things that appear to be really difficult, but I'd love to hear if you have any stories of how you, how you've been transformed through that process. Yeah. I have a lot of those stories. Um, and I, I write about them the way that you do. And I think, you know, we're taught in medicine that you don't talk about yourself. You always talk about cases or patients. And I think this is another example of um, what I've heard described as, you know, kind of vulnerability together with um, competency. Mm -hmm. And I think when you bring both of those, that's really where the best healing occurs. So, you know, the most recent experience that I've been thinking about is um, growing up with a grandfather who was black mm -hmm. and he was the person in my family that I was the closest to. He was an engineer trained at MIT wow. and um, he's, I think I got, uh, I have the black race on both sides of my family, but um, he's the one that I was closest to. And I started to really think more of racism in medicine uh, over the past year and a half. And I felt like I needed, he died um, a few years ago, but I, I feel like his DNA lives on in me and it lives on with a legacy and uh, invitation to address the racism, the racial disparity, the social determinants of health that still exist in medicine. So I think that's the most recent example and I'm happy to go further with some of those things. But other health issues, you know, you and I connected talking about breast cancer. My story is not as dramatic as yours, but um, I had this experience of um, a lot of breast biopsies followed by discovering that I had a high risk gene mutation and then going through uh, bilateral mastectomies. And you know how traumatic that is, having tubes in your chest wall for weeks on end, uh, three times. Um, you may have had, I think you even had more than that. 
Um, and then one of the things that came out of this as I was healing from the, the, the mastectomy, I got treated with antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics for a month. And it was the first time in my life that I had broad spectrum antibiotics for so long. And it really, you know, it was like a spray and pray phenomenon where my good bacteria just got wiped out and I ended up having anxiety and insulin resistance and uh, eventually got diagnosed with SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So that, you know, that was a challenge that I went through just uh, three years ago. Um, and I think you and I connected quite a bit about that. The other, one other story that I'll mention, you can kind of tell me which door you want to go behind. Um, when I was in my mid thirties, I was still practicing as an allopathic OBGYN. And uh, I had, I gave birth to my first daughter and I really struggled after giving birth to her. So I went through a divorce. I, um, I had postpartum depression and I was struggling with my weight. I couldn't lose the baby weight that I had. I had terrible PMS and I went to my primary care doctor who said, you know, why don't we start you on Prozac and why don't you take a birth control pill? Cause that solves every hormonal problem a woman has. And, uh, you know, you just need to exercise more and eat less. So that's, that's the pivotal moment for me. That was the epiphany where I, I left his office, you know, kind of ashamed and, uh, feeling guilty. And then I got angry and I realized Oh my gosh, if I'm being told this and I'm a physician, there are millions of women who are being told this and it's the wrong thing. I did not have depression. I did not have, um, you know, a need for a birth control pill. And I was already running, you know, like four miles, four times a week. Exercising more was not necessarily the right answer. So that was when I really would say I had my greatest epiphany and I went to the lab yeah. and checked my hormones and discovered, you know, a whole bunch of hormones were out of whack. Like my, my cortisol was three times what it should have been. Wondering if that wasn't going to be part of it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cortisol, you know, pretty much every female physician that I know who's still in that male model has a cortisol that's three times what it should be. hundred <laughs> percent. I would live that my whole life. So totally get it. Oh, I'm glad you bring that because I'm sure people listening, this is very relevant, whether you are, you know, just starting, um, you know, college and you're a woman or you're in your mid thirties and you're having babies or you have a few children at home or in your forties or still have children or whatever stage of life or even past menopause. Um, this is relevant because so many of us are, especially in the times we're living in right now, there's so much, so there's a, a acronym I learned by Stan Celia years ago, and I love it. It's called NUTS, N-U-T-S. Um, and these are the predictors of things that raise our cortisol and change our HP axis and cause stress. And it's novelty, so something new, unpredictability, uh, threat to ego, and sense of control. And I've often thought right now during the pandemic and all the stuff that's happened, um, even in regards to Black Lives Matter and the trauma and the, all the things that people have been going through, um, novelty, unpredictability, threat to ego, sense of control, every single stress trigger that we could have, most every one of us have all four. So is it any wonder that we're seeing, I don't know about you, but the people I'm seeing come into clinic nowadays, they are under so much stress and the old traumas are coming out. And like, I really feel like I have to be even more centered, more grounded, more empathetic than I've ever been. Um, and even part of why we're doing this is talking about how do we deal with this stuff? We're two successful women who, you know, see patients for a living and we're still navigating some of these things ourselves. It's, we don't, we don't have all the answers and we don't have it all solved, but we have learned, <laughs> haven't we Sarah, in our lives, like you, we've got to really control that cortisol. I loved what you mentioned too, about the doctor saying, you know, running, go do some more exercise and eat less. That mentality is so prevalent. And I might've shared this with you in one of our personal conversations that I was shocked 
shocked in my 40s to learn I had been doing orange theory running all this high intensity high cortisol driven activity and as I worked with a trainer she said you need to slow down and I was like no way <laughs> but as I did I, I basically joke about I stopped exercising and got in the best shape of my life like I lost a large percent body fat by basically stopping the exercise because it was driving the cortisol which was my weak link and same with you the blood sugar issues were I've reversed all of that by controlling the cortisol which is stress so I'd love to talk about all of your stories so I might come back to those but let's talk right now stress this whole what's going on now there's I don't know if there's been in my lifetime a bigger world stressor and and the level of stress and unpredictability and um, uncertainty that I see in everybody's lives the fear the anxiety is that what I've seen at all-time high um, what would you say is some of the advice that we could give people right now? Not that we have all the answers, but um, because this is tough. And those of you listening, some of you might have lost jobs. Some of you have known sick people or still, you know, friends, family that are sick. There's so many things going on. And if you're not dealing with something now, you either just got through something or it's coming. That's just how life is, right? But what, what are some of your best tips to deal with the kind of stress that we're living with today? And um, I'd love to know. Well, I agree with you. And I think the statistics that have been gathered about the pandemic and our response to the pandemic is, uh, is really daunting because we are facing a tremendous period of stress, a period of trauma yes. um, that I would say is on par with some of the wars that we've fight, fought. So it's, um, it is a difficult time, but I would also say the techniques that work now are the same techniques that you and I were talking about a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. And for me, it starts with being able to step outside of yourself, not dissociating, but yeah. being able to get a little distance from the exigencies of life, you know, kind of that crazy town that's happening right before your eyes. So being able to develop some of that witness consciousness, mm -hmm. Uh, that's kind of the fancy term for it, but it's it's really about creating a little distance with the voice that's in your head, with the drama that's unfolding in front of you. And there's so many ways to do that. You know, for some people, it's mindfulness. For others, it's meditation. I'm a fan of yoga and meditation. So I think there's there's many ways to practice this. What I found during COVID, for instance, is that I I need to meditate first thing in the morning and again before I go to bed. Because if I don't do that, there's a way that I'm perseverating. Yeah. I think because I'm staying home right now that I know is not good for me. I know it's leading to me grinding my teeth. It's leading to bruxism and some other things. So I find that adding a little extra meditation during the day is very helpful. I've got my iPhone right here. Every time I type my code into my iPhone, I pause and take a deep breath. I think that's a really helpful technique. But I also would say extraordinary times call for extraordinary measures. And there's, there's some things that I think can be helpful if you want to take it to a more advanced level. You know, I can talk about gardening. Like I, I just love gardening and I've done so much more of that since uh, the pandemic was uh, initially uh, claimed at the beginning of March. Um, I can talk about the exercise that I'm doing. I can talk about, you know, kind of the Zoom hangouts uh, that you and I have done, which I, I know help me with my cortisol. What we know, especially for women, is that if you can activate the tendon befriend, that's a very helpful way to deal with stress. And it can be as simple as, you know, a FaceTime call with someone that you really love to talk to. I've got those set up weekly for myself. I've got yoga every Sunday with my friend, Joe. Oh. And we always talk um, either before or afterwards. The other thing, this is a little deeper, but I feel like I can go deep with you. Um, I think getting back to the point you were making about nuts yeah. and that sense of control, I think the sense of control in some ways is like a total illusion. Yeah, yeah. And um, I, I would say a big part of the challenge that I had as I was going through my medical training was because I was taught that I needed to control everything. Mm 
Mm-hmm. You know, at, at that time we had these note cards. I don't know if you had those where you do all the check boxes for what your patients need every day. You know, like you had this idea, uh, I'm going to control everything on this note card. <laughs> you know, I'm going to do everything on this note card and then I'll be able to leave at 6 p.m. after working 36 hours. Yeah. And it turns out that like control is a total illusion. Yes. <laughs> and the more that we can surrender to it and just kind of dance with what's unfolding, it's just so much better for your cortisol. It's so much better for the way your brain talks to your gut, talks to your microbiome. Um, it makes a huge difference. And I, I think it's relevant here with COVID-19. What do you think? Oh, I love that because, uh, gosh, I'm a, a, re- a recovering perfectionist, recovering control freak. So, um, and not that I have it all made, but I think that those are some of the most important things that I've learned is letting go of expectations. And I'll tell you whether it's your work life and your clinical staff or your patients, especially because we can give them information and help them and love them and encourage them and give them resources, but ultimately it's in their control. And even if, even the things that are in their control, um, ultimately the outcome is, is up in the air that we can't control those outcomes. And I know, I'm sure you've had this before when the first patient you love and have cared for for years passes away or something happens that is tragic. And there's a sense of like, oh my gosh, could I have done something different? And usually the truth is we've done the best we can and they have too. And these are things that just happen obviously in life. Um, I find with the relationships too, usually the things that really sabotage, whether it's romantic or friendships is expectations, right? So if we can give the people we love freedom to really be themselves in all their glory and all the other parts, right? And allow them to show up as themselves without expectation. Not that we can't say, hey, let's, you know, have dinner every Friday night, a date night. We can have those kinds of expectations or agreements between us, but um, the expectations of, of making them into something that we want versus who they really were and or created to be. I love continually reminding myself to let people be themselves and love them just where they are. And one thing I feel that um, when I see friend, family, new person I meet, I have the ability, I suspect you do too, to see the soul level so people can be like, even patients, they can be coming and they're really critical and they're hard to talk to. And they like got this, um, you know, veneer up of, of like, mm, don't mess with me. And I see right through that. I'm like, they're hurt. There's some trauma there. There's something else going on. And I actually find this little inner challenge. Like, how can I love them in order to break down that barrier? <laughs> it's like this little secret of my, like, I want to really break through. And and the other day I had a patient who was almost combative on the phone and she, everything I would mention, she was, it was Zoom and everything I would mention, no, well, I can't do that. Can't do that. This is why. And I just kept coming back, coming back. And at the very end, I said, okay, let's pause. I can see that you've been traumatized by the system and I can see that there's a lot of lack of trust and there's a lot of anger and I know it's not directed towards me. I said, there's nothing you can do or say to me that will make me love you any less. And I said, I'm here for you. I'm not leaving. You can say anything you want. I'm still going to be here and I'm going to take care of you and I'm going to love you. And you could not imagine immediately your face changed. She started weeping. And I don't know if that'll permanently change her interactions, but I, I saw her soul. It was broken. It was hurt. It was like an animal who's been hurt and cornered and tries to lash out. And we see that in people that we love. We see that in our patients. And if we can start to see people just in that place that we're human and there's trauma and there's pain and see past that to the soul and for me, I love to see what the potential is in human. And I actually do it to a fault because some people who maybe don't deserve a second, third, fourth chance, I tend to give it. But I'd much rather be that and assume the best and expect the best because I've seen miracles in my patients' lives, in my friends and family lives and relationships because I have this expectation of good and what they're capable of. And it transforms people to be seen that way. Well, this is why we love Jill Carnahan so much. <laughs> It's a, it's a beautiful testament, I think, to what you've overcome in your experience and how you bring that forward to patient care, to teaching, to your friendships. Um, that moment that you had where you asked that, that patient to pause, to me, that was a moment of undefended love like no defensiveness about all the excuses she was giving you, 
no defensiveness about how she was treating you or blaming her or blaming someone else. Just, you know, like this pure light of undefended love. And to me, that's, that's our job on this planet is to get to that place of undefended love, even in the moments where you are fully tested, uh, you know, to be able to show up with that, that level of connection and love. That's, to me, that's, that's our highest purpose. I would say service and undefended love. Those are our highest purposes. I love that wording too. I love it. And you're making me cry. <laughs> I'm very touched um, by your words. And I do, I know you do too, but like, I really, I don't always do it right, but I so badly want to show up with light and love in every encounter. And it's so funny because our humanness gets in the way, right? Because even when this patient, like I could feel myself getting riled up and I could feel myself getting like almost anxious because it was so hard to keep a calm demeanor. And then I just hit me, wait a second, this is not about you're getting triggered. And this isn't about that she wants to trigger you because that's she's she's cornered, she's scared. And but it doesn't always happen that way. But when I can see past that and then show up with that's where the healing starts. Totally. That healing starts because this person, no amount of supplements or suggestions or lifestyle changes would have helped what was there at the core was old trauma and old anger and a whole situation I won't go into. But when she started to share, I realized how much unresolved anger and bitterness and unforgiveness were there. And really the core issue with her healing wasn't about a pill. It wasn't about a a lack of sleep or a diet change. It was about those emotions that she was harboring that were keeping her in bondage. And I hope that maybe somehow we opened the door just a little bit um, for her to know that it was safe because really that's the other thing. If we can uh, create a place for our patients where it's safe, um, we talk about the pandemic and all this, it's really this danger response that we're feeling. It's unsafe. We can't go outside. We can't touch a human being. We can't, you know, breathe. (laughs) All these things that we do, like breathing is pretty important, touching human beings. And I love, I think you and I both either, I know you met uh, Dr. Nadine Burke and then I read her book and I was impressed that you had connected with her. But I love that book. It's called The Deepest Well. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend it. It really touched me because number one, the inequalities with race are very prevalent there. And it's not that all trauma is race-based, but there's certainly a a larger degree of trauma in um, certain races. And that's so sad because it definitely, I think the statistics show, and you can correct me or or share your thoughts, um, it is the biggest predictor of mortality or morbidity is um, unaddressed childhood trauma. Would you agree, or at least one of the biggest? Well, it's hard to do, you know, sort of a side-by-side comparison, but um, the work on adverse childhood experience, I think, is really interesting because um, and Nadine Barcaris has been such a great advocate. She's the Surgeon General for the state of California, uh, which is how I met her mm-hmm. a few months ago. But one of the things she's done is she wants every physician in California to start screening for adverse childhood experiences. And so what we know with ACEs is that having a score of one or higher puts you at this greater risk of a long list. You know, I think there's like 46 outcomes that are associated with it. She starts off her book with this incredible story of a a man who's in his forties who wakes up and he can't move his arm and his leg on the left side. And it turns out he's having a stroke and she overhears um, his wife takes him to the ER and she overhears the doctor saying, you know, 42 year old male status post stroke, no risk factors. And his greatest risk factor is that his ACE score is elevated. So it's one of those risk factors that I think we don't consider enough. How that compares to other social determinants of health, it's a little hard for me to do a side-by-side comparison. See, I just got out of my parasympathetic and I went into my sympathetic drive to answer that question. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I know. I want to take this back to to a couple of things you said about this experience with your patient because... um, I want to honor you. You know, you, you were talking about how you were starting to get triggered, which I think is the normal response for so many of us, especially on Zoom, where it's a little hard to read the body language of another person. And if someone freezes for a few seconds, you're like, oh my God, what did I say? <laughs> but I, I think uh, 
You know, the work of Eckhart Tolle, I think, is really interesting here. He talks about pain bodies and how, you know, as a result of trauma and maybe abuse, uh, we have this reservoir of pain and we can try to activate it in other people um, because it makes us feel better. And I think to, to notice that happening on a Zoom telemedicine appointment, to notice that, you know, there's a little triggering happening here is very advanced. And to be able then to kind of take it down a few notches and ask to pause and kind of break the energy of the pain body and then speak more directly to her soul. Yeah. That's very beautiful. And what, what it does, just like what I just did uh, talking about ACEs, I think it helps us with that limbo um, or balance that we want between the parasympathetic nervous system where we do rest and digest and healing, that's where all the healing happens, versus the sympathetic half of the autonomic nervous system, which is fight, flight, freeze. And we want as much as possible, especially when it comes to healing, to be in that place of the parasympathetic nervous system. So what I hear you saying, if I put it in you know, medical language, you were having this interaction with the patient. She was um, pushing back and combative and it was starting to take you into the sympathetic nervous system. And you said, no, wait, hold up, pause. Let's go back to the parasympathetic. And I just want you to know, nothing you say will make me love you any less. Like that's, that's like pure language from the parasympathetic nervous system. Wow. And back to our speaking, like that's not normal on the stage, but when we can bring that piece to the stage and to the teaching and even to our writing, that Sarah is what's going to transform people's lives. The science is great because your analytical mind needs the background to have this foundation in order to believe what's true, right? I love the science, but that piece that you just described, that is how we change our world. And so I just continue, I don't have it all, but I want it so bad. <laughs> I want to be that. Yeah. Well, I witnessed it with you. I witnessed it um, May 2019 when mm -hmm. you were on the stage in Orlando mm -hmm. and you were talking about your story. I could feel it. Oh. I was listening to, um, you gave a talk for A4M on the gut mm -hmm. a few, I think in May, yeah. I witnessed it again. You know, you were talking about, I think, coconut oil and LPS and <laughs> you teach in a way that activates the parasympathetic nervous system. You show up with that coherence that I think is so profound. Oh, I just had to get rid of my black suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we just have to show up in our dresses and like be, uh, you have to be Jill and I have to be yeah, Sarah. Exactly, unapologetically. And I, you know, I remember the day when it shifted and it's been a process, but I remember really clearly the day when, you know, years ago, what I would do is like, oh my gosh, what if I trip? What if I fall? Is my dress okay? Is my hair okay? Are people going to, because women are kind of critical and they look at your shoes and they're going to look at your hair and they're going to look at your lipstick. And so I, you know, I wanted to be put together and I was all worried about me, my words, my dress. To, and then God just was like, wait a second, Jill, um, I've called you to touch people's lives and it's not about you. I'm using you. And I've given you a gift of words and voice and speaking and knowledge. It's not about you. If you just trust me and you allow me to speak through you, um, I promise it'll be a better outcome. <laughs> and I really remember like that, the surrender. We just talked about that. Like before I went on stage that day, I said a little prayer. I'm like, God, this is all about you. Let me just be up there. And I just let go of all expectations. I surrendered to the outcome. No, you know, no outcome, no expectations. And I didn't care. I thought, you know what? If I trip, I'll look human. It'll be good. People will see I'm just a normal, you know, if my dress rips or something funny happens, it's just okay. And I just let go of all that expectation and that desire to be seen or heard as a certain way. Let it go. And just thought, okay, how can I love the people that I'm in front of? And it changed everything that day. And from then on, when I get, before I go on stage, I just have a little prayer of like, this isn't about me, whatever's supposed to happen, let it be. And I'm more spontaneous. And what happens is I'll be on stage with a plan for what I'm going to say. And I'll look across the room and see a woman in tears and I'll have a thought and I might go a totally different direction and tell a story on the spot. 
and it'll be so much more impactful than if I planned it. And I love living that way. And again, it's, it's a practice, but when but it's so freeing. because you can It's just- so freeing. And I, I think it's really important for our listeners who maybe struggle with, I don't like this term, adrenal fatigue, but yeah. I think that's, you know, what it ends up getting named. I like to think of it as, you know, I'm an engineer. So I like to think of the control system for your hormones, yeah, <laughs> hypothalamic pituitary adrenal, thyroid, gonadal, gut axis is disrupted. But I think for people who are really struggling with cortisol and with stress, which is, you know, 95% of my patients, this is the answer. Mm-hmm. You know, being able to kind of turn over the reins, the, to be able to say, I'm a channel. You know, it doesn't absolve you of responsibility. I still have two daughters that I have to raise. I still have a mortgage I have to pay. But that idea that you don't have to do 100% of the work, like you you do your 50% and you let your higher power, however you conceive that to be, to the other half. Oh my gosh, what a huge relief. Huge. It is. Oh my gosh, it is. It's funny because as I've been writing... um, my book, um, there's these things that'll come out and I didn't really realize it's how I view life or see life. But when you have to write, it's like therapy, right? You have to actually put into formulation what you're thinking or feeling or how you're behaving. And sometimes you see stuff you don't like and then you're like, okay, I got to change that. But one thing that comes to mind as you're talking is there's a chapter coming out uh, talking about believing, acting, and waiting. And I realized my whole life, this is a lot of how I live. I have this belief that miracles are possible, that the unexplainable could happen and that beautiful things, you know, are possible. And then I have to do some action. You said it doesn't absolve us of responsibility. So you have to do something. You have to show up. You have to do your part. You have to have the faith. And then the last part is the weight. And that's the part we don't like. And we don't like to think that it's part of it. But so often you do your part and then you wait and you wait. And the beautiful, amazing things that happen are in the waiting and it's the part that we least like to either believe we need to do or, or actually do. Uh, but that waiting is the part, the surrender that actually rebalances our sympathetic parasympathetic system and allows us to go into this place of receiving. And when we think about when you receive a gift, like that's this joyous time we receive this great thing and we're grateful for it. And we know that the, the some of those emotions of receiving and grateful and love, they're the best Um, therapy for our parasympathetic system ever. So it's kind of a neat thing that as we do our part and then wait for the part we can't do, um, that's when we see really great things happen. Love that. I'm trying to find something to disagree with you about because it, you know, makes for more interesting conversation, but I can't find any. But I, I, I agree with you. I think there's something about the waiting that, um, as you said, you know, kind of this state of receiving that um, that's the piece that so many of my patients skimp on for whatever reason, you know, I, I, I'm a recovering inpatient person. And so I totally get it. But when you're not tuned into that frequency of waiting and observing and kind of chronicling what's unfolding in front of you, and instead, you're just like looking for the flaws. Oh, it didn't happen again. I, you know, my prayers weren't answered. It's, um, it's almost like you have blinders on. Yeah. And you can't see like this amazing thing that's happening in front of you. Yeah. And, and what I find is never what I expect or necessarily even what I wanted. It's usually better. But I have to let go of what I expect is the right answer. <laughs> And be open to what might be different or better. And it may not feel like that at the time. But when I look back, for example, you and I have both been through breast surgery and scares with breast cancer. And obviously I've had breast cancer, but I remember 25 years old, third year medical student, talk about stress. There's no doubt that there was a connection between the massive stresses, my suppression of my true nature and my breast cancer. But all that to say, I was mortified. I thought, I don't know if I'm going to live six months or six years. I mean, it was, it was hard, right? 25 and you're dealing with my breast, which as a woman is our fem- a sign of our femininity and all this. And um, the biggest lesson of that is looking back, the doctor I am today is so much impacted by my experience with breast cancer. It was literally the best thing that ever happened to me like literally the the first of the best that ever happened to me to give me the type of ability to be the physician I am today. At the time, it was the worst thing that could have happened. 
but God turned it into this beautiful gift in my life. And I'm sure you've had some of those, I mean, you talked about them, you know, and I'm sure, you know, with your um, surgeries and then your HP axis function, think about when that physician told you, you need birth control and you need antidepressant. That had to be so, like you said, you mentioned shame and difficulty then, but think of that allowed you to write two New York Times bestsellers revolving around your experience and to change millions of women's lives. To me, that's just profound, isn't it? How those things that we think are not really the greatest outcome can be the best thing that ever happened. Absolutely right. And I, I think in many ways, for all the people who are listening or watching to us, uh, watching us, your symptoms can be the same gift. Like their messages, sometimes divine messages of something that needs attention. And even, you know, if we talk about ACEs, we were talking about adverse childhood experiences and uh, how we've got this really good system for diagnosing those. I would say, you know, my ACE score is six mm -hmm. in terms of the amount of trauma I had growing up before age 18. And those ACEs were similar for me as the breast cancer diagnosis at age 25 was for you. They made me exquisitely sensitive, you know, almost like I was walking on eggshells. They got me disembodied so that I was in my head too much of the time and not enough in my heart. But those symptoms that came from that allowed me to, you know, create integration and wholeness that I think makes me a much better physician than I would be if I didn't have an A score of six. So I'm not saying, you know, I'm so glad I was traumatized when I'm, I was growing up, but I, I think there's the opportunity to take these experiences that we have, as you've done with your breast cancer diagnosis, you've done this so gracefully and so um, articulately, and uh, as I hope to do with my ACEs, I think when you can compost those experiences into something that's you know extraordinary, that's where the real healing occurs. I love that. And that was so eloquently said. Um, and I see too, the whole, it's like I had some trauma in childhood too, and maybe not to that extent, but what I saw is it allowed me number one to, uh, for me, it was funny because my outlet was reading and books and learning and I went into my head too. And I would never be the doctor or the one, the love of the learning or books be, if it weren't for that trauma, because that was my outlet was reading and learning. <laughs> so it's interesting how that all plays together, but you put it so eloquently. And I think that's with our listeners. If As we wrap up today, one of the things that right now, if you're listening, I guarantee most of you have some difficulty, some relationship, some job situation, some life situation, or some other thing that you're struggling with. You probably wouldn't be human if you didn't. And like I said, if you haven't, if you aren't right now, you probably just got through something or you're headed towards something. And I think, Sarah, what you just said might be some of the best uh, wisdom that we could leave is that how would you say if right now, you know, I remember when I was in breast cancer and you probably remember some of your traumas in the midst of them, what kind of advice can we leave people with? If you're in the middle of it, how do you navigate? How do you have hope? How do you see past it? Any advice on that when you're right in the middle? Well, you know, one of the things that activates my trauma response is when I get into a fight with my husband. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, this doesn't happen too often. It happens like once every six months when we are less resourceful, we're not sleeping or yep. whatever. So I would say, number one, strengthen your resources. I think that the more that you are getting sleep, which is as close to a panacea as we have, the more that you're, you know, getting sunlight before 10 a.m., the more that you are establishing your circadian rhythm and eating nutritious foods, like all of those things make you more resourceful. And the second part, and this is, you know, it's kind of like when you were getting triggered by that patient and I could sort of feel this empathic triggering myself um, and remember like the scores of patients I've had in yes. that same situation. Um, all it takes is like a little crack in the door to let the light in. So you were able to activate that. You were able to, you know, kind of pivot in that situation. It doesn't take some grand gesture. It just takes like opening the door a teeny little bit to let a little bit of light in, like a little bit of fresh air, a little bit of a new perspective 
so that you can get some distance from this thing that you're, you know, kind of gnashing your teeth with. And, um, and that's where the healing starts. One of the things I did, um, I've been with my husband for 18 years now, and I made a little note on my iPhone, uh-huh. what to do when I'm triggered by my husband. <laughs> oh, I love it. So good for us, all of us. <laughs> so I, I have a list of like all these things that um, I tell myself to calm down, similar to how you calmed yourself yeah. down with that patient. And, you know, it started with just like five bullet points. and Now it's like ridiculously long. But a big part of it is get curious, not furious. Oh, and that's, I borrowed that from somebody. That's not something I came up with. But I think that's a big part of it is, you know, if you can flip into that place of curiosity about your symptoms, about your adrenal fatigue or HBA dysregulation, about your uh, breast cancer diagnosis or whatever it is, if you can get curious, not furious, it opens up you know, the possibilities in a, a much deeper way. Oh, that's beautiful to leave our listeners with, because that's really at the core of that, like you said, the crack. I love that analogy because you can just see it with the sun kind of filtering through. You can see the dust in the air through the, the ray of sunshine. Um, but I can so see how that's really a piece. You don't have to feel super on top of the world joyful about your situation. All you have to do is think, like you said, be curious. What if, what if there was something good here? What if there was something more that I'm seeing? What if there was something that's going to come from this that's really beautiful? So I love that. What if? What if? What what possibilities are here? And that's the getting curious. Um, I think that's a great, great place to leave. You know, we we you shared about your grandfather and how he impacted you. And I love that you shared that, especially in this time and how important it all it, all of us to be aware of racism and even examining ourselves in our own hearts because it's easy to point fingers. And I find the most important thing is to look at ourselves, say, how am I contributing? But I'd love to know in parting, was there any words of wisdom you remember from your grandfather, anything like real special? You had a really close relationship with him. What were what was one thing that he really taught you in life? Mm. Well, I dedicated my first book to him. Mm-hmm. He died just before that was published. And um, I feel like more than anyone else in my family, he understood how I ticked. Like he, he understood my mind and my heart in a way that others were too busy to understand. And what we know is that it only takes one person growing up to kind of get you and uh, be able to reflect back who you are to you, a mirror. And that's what I got from my grandfather. So it was incredibly profound. And, um, and you know, I, whenever I do, I do a lot of guided visualizations and meditations. And whenever you're supposed to pick a benefactor, yeah, he's my benefactor. He's always my benefactor. Oh, I love that. And I bet you feel him. I mean, I know some of the, I just... I've had those experiences where there's someone, I have a, a great, great grandmother and a grandmother and they're both very, very precious. And in difficult times, I've literally felt their presence. Um, that's a whole nother story. But I remember for me learning to have a voice as a woman and stand up for abuse. Um, when I filed my first restraining order, that's a whole nother story. <laughs> but my schedule great- part two, Jill. <laughs> I do. I'm like, okay, we're going to leave you guys hanging. <laughs> to come is the, <laughs> the, the bad relationship choices of Dr. Jill. <laughs> Oh, I've got them too. All the bad boyfriends that raised my cortisol. That'll be a really fun one. All I just say, those, those, those people who came before, what I remember about her coming was like, I felt the strong sense of she didn't have a voice and she couldn't stand up to situations where she was, you know, treated unfairly. And she was like saying, will you please rectify this for our whole lineage? And I was able to do, a, do something that really changed my entire lineage of women. So um, I love that. And I love you right now can take and pass on this incredible spirit of your grandfather through your books, through your teaching, through your love for people and your patients. And I'm sure that he is smiling down on you and so proud of you, Sarah. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> what, I, what I could hear him say as you were talking was, keep going, honey. There's oh. a lot of work to be done. <laughs> I, can I borrow him? <laughs> can I please borrow him? Because I love <laughs> Keep on working. 
I love it. Well, we will leave you all with that. And uh, we'll have to continue someday because now you want to know the stories. Thank you for joining us today. Um, Dr. Godfrey, where can people find you and more about you? The best place to go is sarahgottfriedmd.com. And if you're, you know, one of the things we didn't talk about is I'm going to start seeing new patients again. I've been close to new patients for a number of years. Mm -hmm. And the place to go for that is sarahgottfriedmd.com forward slash patient. Oh, that's exciting. So we'll be sure and put the links in here and on YouTube, my YouTube channel. You can find me at jillcarnahan.com, of course. Thank you all for joining us. It has been such a joy, Sarah. Thank you, Jill.